Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 288th episode, we have a bunch of dinosaur news, including the dinosaur Huwinkelsaurus, which was named recently from South America. We talked about it a little bit last week because it's also an elaphrosaur from the Cretaceous. And we have a bunch of news from around the world, as well as dinosaur of the day, Nothronicus, or Nothronicus, as I would probably say it without looking at the phonetic (laughs) pronunciation. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons who have helped us get through a pretty tough week. And this week, we'd like to thank Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, the Georges family, John Heck, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, Ray, Andrew and Helena Webb, Callum, Ricky, William, Red Sox Rex, Wouter, Moss Utah Raptor, Velociraptor, Goji, Neilovenator, Aussie David, Ellen, Christine, and Diplodocate. And Diplodocate just joined with a fantastic dinosaur-related name. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for all of your support. We really appreciate it. And we've been really enjoying watching the dinosaur movies and documentaries with you these past few weeks. So if you want to watch with us, then please consider joining at patreon.com slash inodino. This week, we're changing the order of our news just a little bit. Before we get into our main dinosaur topics, we just want to acknowledge and talk a little bit about uh, what's been going on in the U.S. in the past few days and weeks. Yeah, normally we don't talk about politics at all on the show because we don't really like talking about politics and they don't usually have much to do with dinosaurs. But we do talk about politics when they relate to dinosaurs. So some of you may have heard about what happened in Central Park in New York between Christian Cooper and Amy Cooper. So Christian Cooper, who is black, was birding in Central Park in New York, and he saw a woman and her dog, and the dog was off leash. And he asked the woman, Amy, to put the dog back on the leash because they were in an area with delicate plants and wildlife, so better to keep the dog on the leash, and that's the official rules there. And she ended up calling 911 on him. So this has led to, maybe you've seen it on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, the hashtag Black Birders Week that was started by a group Black AF in STEM. (laughs) There's, from what I can tell, 31 members. And the whole goal of this week is to draw attention to Black birders and Black nature enthusiasts. So maybe some of you joined on the Instagram Live last night. Hashtag Ask a Black Birder. We watched the whole thing. It was Great, really entertaining, and we learned a lot about birds, which, as you know, are dinosaurs. Yeah, so I like to call them dinosaur watchers rather than bird watchers. <laughs> but I guess dinosaurers is hard to say compared to birders. That's true. It does sound awkward. <laughs> There's a couple other events this week, too. On tomorrow, on Thursday, June 4th, the hashtag is birding while black, and they'll be having a live stream discussion. And then on June 5th, the hashtag is black women who bird, where Everyone's encouraged to follow all the amazing black women who bird. And so Garrett and I doing this podcast, we believe that diversity matters, science matters. And science is better when you have diversity in it, because more viewpoints always helps challenge the hypotheses, which is what science is all about. Yes. And that's why we've been participating in Black Birders Week. Yep. Even though we're not really birders yet, we're getting there. After go- after hearing all these stories on the live stream, it really made me want to be a birder yeah but <laughs> I can't, we've picked I, up some tips yeah dinosaurs non-avian dinosaurs are still so much cooler that i haven't gotten fully into it yet it's only a matter of time you've been saying that for years it's true so for any of you who want to join in for the rest of this week's activities then you can follow the hashtag black birders week mostly on twitter i would say but it's also on instagram and some other places mm-hmm. so now moving from avian dinosaurs Back to the Mesozoic, where we're usually talking about dinosaurs. As promised, we're catching up on this elaphrosaurine dinosaur that we mentioned last week, which is named Huinkelsaurus montezai, and it was written by Mattia Baiano and others in Cretaceous Research. And Huinkelsaurus is so named because it's from the Huinkel formation, and then saurus for lizard, so Huinkel formation lizard or Huinkel formation dinosaur. And then Montez I is after Eduardo Montez from the Carmen Funes Museum, who prepared this and many other fossils. A lot of preparators are getting their due as species names lately. That's great. They deserve it. Yeah. 
So this dinosaur, I think because it's from South America and abelosauroids are pretty common in South America, they classify it as an abelosauroid, which is a pretty big group. It includes all of the dinosaurs with the smallest arms <laughs> of the non-avian theropods, these little tiny arms. And it includes stuff like Carnotaurus and Majungasaurus and all these weird little tiny armed <laughs> predators for the most part. And specifically, Huinclesaurus is from southern Argentina, in case you're wondering. This area is also known as Patagonia, so sometimes we say that instead. They estimate Huinclesaurus was about 3 meters or 10 feet long. You could think of it as kind of a coelophysis with smaller arms. That's about right for its kind of general proportions and it's real skinny and everything, just like the Elaphrosaurine from Australia we were talking about last week. And also, like we mentioned last week, it may have had a really weird head, possibly toothless as an adult, but unfortunately we didn't find any skull material, so we don't really know what the head on this thing is like. It could have been anything from like a normal theropod to a super weird thing <laughs> like Lemosaurus or something in between. In total, we only found about five vertebrae, which is four more vertebrae than they found from the Australian Elaphrosaur, but not all that much more. So I'm a little bit surprised that they gave it a name because they didn't give the Australian Elaphrosaur a name. But in this case, they decided to name it, and it's based on just these five vertebrae from where the back of the dinosaur meets the hips, because there are vertebrae that go through the hips as well. So there's three dorsal or back vertebrae and two sacral or hip vertebrae. As we hinted at last week, Huinclesaurus is very young for an elaphrosaur. It's from the late Cretaceous, about 95 million years old, plus or minus a couple million years. And that does make it significantly younger than the Australian elaphrosaur, because that one is technically from the end of the early Cretaceous, whereas this one is from the beginning of the late Cretaceous. The Australian Elaphrosaur is about 110 to 107 million years old, so Huinclesaurus is more recent or younger than the Australian find by about 10 to 15 million years, which isn't huge in the timescale of dinosaurs, but for just about any other creature, that's a really long time. And for a quick comparison, Lemosaurus and Elaphrosaurus were in the 150 to 160 million year old time frame, and those are pretty much the only other Elaphrosaurs we knew about, so Either one of these jumped us forward 50 million years in dinosaurs and from the Jurassic into well into the Cretaceous, so they're both pretty important. As a result, Huinclesaurus is the youngest known Elaphrosaurine, and that must have been part of the title <laughs> of the Australian find because they said they had to revise it after this one got published, just beating them to the presses. The five vertebrae that they found were actually found way back in 1991, and I guess just sat around either waiting to be prepared or waiting to be described for about 30 years. And they're all really long and skinny, including the zygopophyses, which are those little things that stick out of the vertebrae and give them a sort of star shape. So pretty weird looking vertebrae. In their analysis, they said it's more closely related to a Laphrosaurus from the Jurassic than other Cretaceous abelosauroids, which is why they put it into that Elaphrosaurinae group rather than it being some other sort of abelosauroid, which was contemporary with it. And this group also found a lot of similarities with the Ornithomimosaur aphromimus. And others have suggested that the lack of Elaphrosaur fossils might be because they're often misidentified as Ornithomimosaurs. So in the future, I'm kind of expecting a lot of people to look through their ornithomimosaur material and then realize, wait a second, this might be from an elaphrosaur. And so we might start seeing elaphrosaurs popping up all over the world and maybe the number of ornithomimosaurs shrinking a little bit. Or maybe some of the ornithomimosaurs are going to be named like ornitho something and then it'll be known as an elaphrosaur afterwards and be super confusing like what happened with Megaraptor not being a raptor. So... <laughs> Yeah, no matter what, I think things are going to get a little bit confusing as we sort out what are ornithomimosaur fossils and what are elaphrosaur fossils. But elaphrosaurs are super cool with their weird heads and their overall strange theropod body plan. So I'm pretty excited to see where all of this heads. Me too. In other news, in Taipei, Taiwan, there's an exhibition called Evolution of the Banana Fish Solo Exhibition that's going on from now until June 6th, so a few more days. And the character artist who created the exhibition wrote on the Facebook event page that 
Quote, this exhibition gives a glimpse into the banana past as it traces <laughs> banana evolution from microbial life through to the impact event that ended the reign of the non-avian banana dinosaurs, end quote. So there's a lot of sculptures and paintings and more in the banana fish style, which is this pretty cute style. It looks a lot like it sounds. It looks like the first character that the artist made is a fish. It looks kind of like a banana. The fins look like the peel. So I saw some images online of the prehistoric animals. There's a lot of them. There's banana brontosaurus, banana ankylosaurus, banana ornithomimus, banana carithosaurus, banana iguanodon, banana troodon, banana spinosaurus, banana triceratops. They're all pretty cute. <laughs> I'd definitely describe them as kind of cartoony mm -hmm. and fun, not like paleo art. <laughs> <laughs> Still very cool. So entry is free to the exhibition. Uh, visitors must wear a mask and then you'll be asked to sign in and get your temperatures checked. In Mount Isa, or maybe it's Mount Isa, in Queensland, Australia, there's a family, well, a mother, a Destiny Rackman, and her father and her father's employees all built Jurassic Park gates for Destiny's five-year-old birthday party last year. And now those gates are on sale. So they built it <laughs> over the course of four weekends they had to use forklifts and scaffolding to reach the top. And it's pretty impressive in the picture. It looks really a lot like the Jurassic Park gates. Is it like the same size as the Jurassic Park gate? Can you drive through it? I don't think you can drive through it. You can walk through it based on the picture. And the gate reads, Alana's Jurassic Park. Alana's the five-year-old. So they need to find another Alana who <laughs> yeah. wants a Jurassic Park gate, and then they'll be able to sell it. You could probably change the name at the top. <laughs> I suppose. Pretty cool project. Also in Australia, but near Darwin, there's a large fiberglass dinosaur known as Big Kev that was recently reassembled in Palmerston, a nearby city. And Big Kev's a Brachiosaurus who had been in pieces at a site outside of Darwin for a year because the landscape supply store where Big Kev had been since 2007 had moved. So now people can see Big Kev in Palmerston and there's plans to build a viewing platform around this dinosaur. Nice. In media news, the 28th season of Power Rangers is going to be called Power Rangers Dino Fury. <laughs> it's for Power Rangers fans out there. It's going to be on Nickelodeon sometime in 2021. And the synopsis is, quote, when an army of powerful alien beings is unleashed on Earth threatening life as we know it, a brand new team of Power Rangers fueled by the prehistoric power of the dinosaurs are recruited to deal with the threat. I wonder if they can turn into dinosaurs. I don't know much about Power Rangers. <laughs> But for comic book fans, Captain Marvel number nine had Captain Marvel punch two T-Rex who appeared out of nowhere in the middle of the street in New York City, and they're fighting each other. And apparently she takes them out in one punch. Makes sense. Yeah, she is very strong. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Nothronychus, which was a request from Dinosaur 4602. So thanks. Nothronychus was a Therizinosaur theropod that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now North America. And that's how you know it was a weird one. It was an herbivore, <laughs> but it was a theropod. All therizinosaurs are weird. Yeah. It weighed about one ton, and it was bipedal. It walked pretty upright. It had a small head and a beak and four toes on each foot, and all the toes faced forward. It also had leaf-shaped teeth and a long neck, long arms, and three long claws on each hand. Really, really long claws. Yes. Oh, and there was the pot belly, short stumpy legs, and a short tail. <laughs> so very weird. <laughs> but yeah, the claws were about nine inches or 22 centimeters long. And I think that's without the keratin. I think that's just the bone alone. Yeah, very long claws. Nothronychus could eat tough plants. And being a therizinosaur, therizinosaurs in general may have had primitive feathers. The type species is Nothronychus mckinleyi. And it was described and named in 2001 by James Kirkland and Douglas Wolfe. There was a second species named in 2009 by Lindsay Zano and others, Nothronychus graphemi, and that was found in the Tropic Shale of Utah, making it one and a half to three million years older than Nothronychus mckinleyi. Nothronychus graphemi is estimated to be 15 to 20 feet or four and a half to six meters long, and Nothronychus mckinleyi is a little smaller. So, Nothronychus mckinleyi was not as robust as Nothronychus graphemi, and its ulna was more bent. The genus name, Nothronychus, means slothful claw. <laughs> and that's because it probably used its large claws to hook branches and eat in a style similar to a sloth. The species name is in honor of Bobby McKinley. The fossils were found on his land. 
And then Merle Graffin found the second specimen and species in Utah in 2000, which was a large toe bone. Nothronychus was the first therizinosaurid found in North America. Previously, they'd only been found in China and Mongolia. And therizinosaurids were herbivores, but many of their relatives were carnivores. Since they were theropods. Mm -hmm. Having the big belly, that meant that it had a large digestive system that's good for digesting vegetation. Yeah, if you want to know what it looks like, there's a really good skeletal drawing by Scott Hartman on SkeletalDrawing.com. And you can see its super weird proportions with that pot belly and short tail and big claws and everything, <laughs> including the proposed length of the claw with the keratin sheath, which is really cool to see. Yeah. So therizinosaurids are thought to be primitive manoraptors, which is a group that started in Asia and includes Velociraptor. And the discovery of Nothronychus helped show that dinosaurs like Therizinosaurus, which was an herbivorous theropod, were not as rare as people had previously thought. And also that many kinds of Manoraptorans were herbivores or omnivores, and that meant they could travel to new areas and branch out and become a more diverse group. Yeah, maybe Therizinosaurus were omnivorous, and they use those claws every once in a while to just brutally take down some prey. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Yeah, it's possible that the Manoraptor in common ancestor was an herbivore or an omnivore. Lindsay Zano said in a Live Science article in 2009 that, quote, predatory Manoraptor and dinosaurs like Velociraptor must have re-evolved exclusive meat-eating, end quote. So Therizinosaurs had a lot of teeth. They didn't replace their teeth that often. They had the long necks and the small skulls and then large guts. And so all of those characteristics show that they were herbivorous. When Therizinosaurus, which is the first Therizinosaur, was found, it was originally thought to be a giant sea turtle because of its large claws, but it later became known as a Therizinosaurid when more fossils were found and referred, and that included the hind limb and forelimb, which are very unturtle like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> wow. So Nothronychus McKinleyi was excavated in the early to mid-1990s. It was found in New Mexico near the border of Arizona in the Zuni Basin, the Morena Hill Formation Haystack Butte site, which was around 91 million years ago. The first Nothronychus fossil found was a hip bone, but originally that was thought to be part of the skull crest of the Ceratopsian Zuni Ceratops. So that's not to be confused with Therizinosaurus, different dinosaur thought to be a sea turtle. Nothronychus was thought to be a ceratopsian. <laughs> it's all over the place. Well, weird group. <laughs> so the holotype of Nothronychus includes skull fragments, a brain case, vertebrae, parts of the shoulder girdle, forelimbs, pelvis, and hind limbs. Barry Albright and others excavated Nothronychus graphemi in 2000, and they found about 80% of the skeleton, but it was pretty crushed, and they didn't find a skull. And that makes it reportedly the most complete Therizinosaur ever found. So it's very important, and it filled in a lot of gaps in our knowledge about Therizinosaur anatomy. Yeah. The Nothronychus graphemi find in Utah was a surprise, too, because that area was known to be under the Western Interior Seaway in the late Cretaceous. So most likely the skeleton was swept out to sea after it died. The shoreline, or the land on the Western Interior Seaway, was about 60 miles or 100 kilometers away from where Nothronychus graphemi was found. So not surprisingly, Nothronychus graphemi was found in an area with a lot of plesiosaurs and other marine fauna. It's pretty amazing. It made it 60 miles out there and none of those animals ate it. It was still 80% complete after it fossilized. Yeah, but very crushed. Nothronychus mckinleyi was found in an area that included the Ceratopsian Zuni Ceratops, Hadrosauroid, Hayawadi, Tyrannosaurs, and lots of fossilized wood. I wonder if all that fossilized wood means that it got swept out in some crazy situation that made it hard for anything to really gobble it up. Oh, that was the wrong species. It's Nothronychus graphemi that was with the sea. Nothronychus mckinleyi was with the wood. Oh, gotcha. And you can see Nothronychus graphemi at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And our fun fact of the day was inspired by a post we did for Blackbirders Week because one of the days was post a bird. So I picked the cassowary, which we saw in a zoo in Adelaide, Australia, because they are amazing and they look like dinosaurs. <laughs> and a little bit terrifying. Yes. If you haven't seen a cassowary, you should definitely Google it. They sort of look like an ostrich. They're also paleonaths. So they have two big legs. They stand up fairly tall and then they've got that big feathery ball body. <laughs> 
just like an ostrich or an emu. And then they got a fairly long neck and then, you know, a little head. And big claws. Yes. Cassowaries have huge claws on their toes, especially one of the claws is about like four to five inches long. And they have a bright blue neck, blue and red neck, and a big crest on the top of their head that's a few inches tall as well, which looks kind of like a big fingernail. It's not really colored. It's kind of gross looking, actually. But (laughs) cassowaries are really interesting and definitely modern dinosaurs. So speaking of dinosaur claws... Therizinosaurs, especially like Nothernicus, have really huge claws. Therizinosaurus had claws about twice as big as Nothernicus, estimated to be as big as one meter or three feet long. And that's including the keratin sheath, which was almost certainly covering the bone. And we can say that because all modern claws have at least two major parts. They have a bone inside them, which is usually the only thing that fossilizes or would fossilize. And then there's a sharp keratin covering that protects the bone and is a lot easier to replace as well because it's made out of keratin. So it grows just like a fingernail or anything. It's really our fingernails are basically a type of claw. Dogs, cats and birds also have an area in between the bone and the keratin called the quick, like running quickly. (laughs) It's full of blood vessels and nerves. And if you've ever tried to trim your dog, cat or bird's claws, you know you have to be careful when you're trimming them not to accidentally cut the quick because it can bleed a lot and it's really sensitive. Quicks and keratin wouldn't fossilize except in extremely rare cases. We've seen some basically outlines of where we think keratin was around a claw and that's how people really started noticing, oh, these claws were a lot bigger than just the skeletons alone would make us think. But I've never heard a paleontologist mention a quick. I think it's not all that important because the size of the quick varies a lot by individual and it's just the blood supply so it doesn't really impact the animal all that much the bone portion of a cat claw because i think that's one of the best analogs that we have for a dinosaur claw is about one third the total claw length so if you look at it the bone is like really just barely in there (laughs) then the quick fills up maybe two-thirds to three-quarters of it and then the keratinus surrounds all of that cassowaries and harpy eagles have the longest claws of any living birds they're about five inches or 10 to 13 centimeters long and for comparison grizzly bear claws are only four inches long so these are some serious claws (laughs) on cassowaries and harpy eagles cassowary bones fill almost the entire claw sheath But I don't think it's a very good analog for dinosaur claws, especially hand claws, because cassowaries stand on their claws. So they get worn down by walking and they just serve a pretty different purpose than like grasping claws on something like an allosaurus that you would see might expect them to be a little bit longer and sharper. The raptor claws on something like a harpy eagle, I think, are a little bit better, but they're talons. So they have to also grasp things that they stand on with them as well as their prey. So I don't know. And I couldn't find any really good depictions of how much of a harpy eagle talon is bone because everybody wants the biggest thing so nobody ever takes the keratin off it you just keep this huge massive thing with the keratin and the bone inside it if you're collecting them or studying them one other note is back at svp in 2017 caleb brown estimated ceratopsian horns may have been about 50 percent longer and stegosaurus plates could have been about 30 percent larger oh when gosh. including the keratin covering <laughs> So, yeah, it's not just claws that get bigger by these keratin sheaths. It could also be ornamental features that use keratin for display. That's crazy. Yeah. So definitely when you're at a museum, try to keep in mind that just seeing the skeleton doesn't give you the full scale. You need to maybe add 50% or twice as much to the scale to get the full (laughs) keratinized covering. It's already so large. Yeah. But bigger is better. (laughs) Well, sometimes. When it comes to display structures and claw grabbing ability. Okay, I'll give you that. (laughs) I thought you'd be all about it with your love of sauropods. I do love sauropods, but, you know, good things come in small packages, too. Oh, personally speaking, yes. Hmm. (laughs) And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our growing dinosaur community, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.